Good evening. For those uh, listening online, um, Associate Pastor Sean Mercer filling in for uh, Pastor Rick this evening. And, uh, if you have your Bibles, open up, if you would, to Colossians chapter 2, verse 2. <clears throat> So Colossians chapter 2, verse 2. I like the sound of pages, so I'm going to do that in the microphone. <clears throat> I hope we don't lose that. Well, Colossians 2, we're going to look at uh, chapter 2, verse 2. I'll read it through and then uh, follow through with comments. So Colossians 2, verse 2. Paul speaking here that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. So looking at the uh, title tonight, not philosophy, but Christ, as we kind of look at uh, again the, the passage here, not a philosophy we have our faith in, but a person, not a uh, set of rules or rituals, but Christ. And uh, as we kind of look through that, look at it from different aspects there, we, the passage, the verse here kind of breaks up nicely. Uh, the first couple of lines, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love. We'll look at that. And then on to attaining to all riches. And then the next thought there of the full assurance of understanding. And then finish out the verse there. But uh, again, not philosophy, but Christ world obviously being a marketplace for philosophy if uh, no shortage of belief systems rules regiments 10-step programs five-step programs and for the lazier of us three-step programs so again kind of looking at all of the different things that uh, the voices all of the different again philosophies and uh, really thinking of the world and just how it's packaged how it uh, is presented, nothing new under the sun as we know. And um, I mean quite reiterated, but obviously for us in our brief lifetime, all things are somewhat new in that sense. But uh, again, you know, no shortage of beliefs. So the one that came to mind pretty easily was uh, sitting with your legs crossed saying the phrase, um, and uh, I think it stands out for me because my grandmother would never let me say that word. Um is not a word. And as an 8, 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old boy, um, is just about every other word. So very, very familiar and something that kind of sticks out. But uh, obviously, as you get older, seeing that, visualizing that in your mind, and uh, seeing that person participate in that, thinking that will bring something good. Again, <clears throat> truth mixed up, but packaged in a lie. So, and, uh, so if the flesh or the world or uh, Satan through his demons can't get someone to believe and live for a total lie maybe that person will believe parts of a lie maybe that's again what we can do to deceive that person uh, and at the very least live a deceived life or distracted or even worse to live separated from God so ascribing to a philosophy here Paul writing to the Colossians a uh, very beautiful letter, as we kind of work through the first two ch uh, first two chapters there, uh, quite doctrinal, and then the uh, second two chapters, third and fourth, really the correct response for the believer that ascribes to it. Paul here is writing to people he hasn't met, a church that he hasn't visited, and uh, again, at the time of this, a political prisoner, but I'd like to get further into the philosophy side real quick before we get into kind of the history and the background of the letter. But um, again, God's word being the filter, and it takes finality to make it stick. So we ascribe to the truth, we believe it to be true, and then we live our lives accordingly, uh, again, in that truth. So um, this from Vernon McGee, <clears throat> whoops, sorry, Second Peter 1.3, thinking of, again, Christ as a... Uh, all things to us. So Second Peter 1, 3, for those note takers, I'll read it to you. As his divine, speaking of Jesus, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness 
through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So again, as his divine power has given to us all things, not some things, not most things, but that very exclusive phrase of all things. And you know, living life for a while, kind of moving through life, life takes quite a bit of doing to get done well. Uh, all of the different, again, voices, all the different decisions, just our flesh alone, a very formidable enemy. And then we have the world working against us as well, <clears throat> telling us what to believe, trying to tug us in all different directions. Again, the, what life can throw at a person, <clears throat> very unknown what a day will bring. So again, not sticking to simply a philosophy, a set of rules, but Christ himself, and again, learning what that's all about. But back to Second Peter 1.3 here, given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So all things that pertain to this life and seeking after a life of godliness through the knowledge of him, speaking of Christ, who has called us by glory and virtue. So he has given to us all things. And on the receiving end, there we are, taking what we'd like, and hopefully, obviously, all of it. But again, the different things that come our way. Maybe a, uh, an easy way to, again, get out of work. <clears throat> the devil tempted Jesus with, well, you can have everything. You just you don't have to go to the cross. All you've got to do is bow down and worship me. An alternate route, an easier route. And again, the incorrect route. The harder route, but the correct route. <clears throat> so this from Vernon McGee. It is only through the knowledge of Christ that you can really learn to live down here and grow to be a more godly person. The only way in the world that you can become the kind of person with a fully developed personality is through knowing Jesus Christ. The knowledge of him that hath called us to glory means to be like Christ. I did, uh, for a fleeting moment, think about the southern drawl that Vernon McGee has. Though I do have a southern drawl, it's just not that southern one. So, <laughs> Again, philosophy made up of different pieces, not just that we are saved or that Jesus has paid for our sins, not all of the truths that go together, but the whole thing. And then other things, again, added on to that. <clears throat> parts of philosophy in the sense of parts of the, the truth that God has given to us and laid out for us in his word. But that overarching theme of our faith isn't in those particular things. It's in him himself. It's in him himself. <clears throat> as long as he has, oh, sorry, all the truths of the Bible fit together to become our faith again. So we'll take a few just to kind of maybe help explain what this, what it means. So our faith is in God. <clears throat> uh, he is the creator. So he is our savior. He is truth. He is life. He's not those things independent of the other. He's all of those things and obviously a lot more. So our trust is in him, just to take those few and kind of build upon these. So we trust and believe he is the creator. We trust and believe he is our savior. We trust and believe he is the truth. We trust and believe he is our life. He created all, so we rule out other creators or philosophies that teach otherwise. <clears throat> he is our savior, so we rule out others that preach themselves or systems as something that will save. He is truth, so we must rule out anything else that wants to be recognized as truth that doesn't line up with God's word. He is our life, and we spend our resources living more and more for him to be, again, more like Christ. He is life, and we choose to give him our lives, to which we are reborn, and again, we live in him. So, obviously, that's not an exhaustive list, but taking those few truths of who God is and building upon that, and again, having that be the excluding factor, running things through God's word and seeing that if it doesn't line up with him, it doesn't line up with me. And it's just that simple, and it's hard to keep that out because it might sound good, it might sound easy. It might sound true. And likely there's parts of it that are. But as far as truth, he is it. And he is all things. So, again, <clears throat> you know, wanting to, 
I mean, as a young boy, you're always looking for the easiest way, right? I mean, it's just, that's how it is. And you learn oftentimes you're just not as smart as you think you are. And you'd think that'd be it. Okay, tried that one time, I'm good. I, I will, next time I will follow direction. Well, that'd be nice. <clears throat> um, as God reveals more to us of our faith and all the different facets of it, do we start to pick and choose? And again, naturally there are areas of resistance. So you get saved, all things are new, the greens are greener, the blues are bluer, the air smells nicer, and all the rest of it. But uh, as his word, as we read, and as we, again, are in communion now with the creator of the universe, naturally there are areas of resistance. And though we can't clean house all at once, it better not, let, it better not get the better of us. You know, thinking of uh, Gideon, I'll read it to you from Judges 8.13 through 8.16. Um, again, good one to read to the young boys if you have them. Then Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle from the ascent of Herez, and he caught a young man of the men of Sukkoth and interrogated him. And he wrote down for him the leaders of Sukkoth and its elders, seven, uh, 77 men. And he came to the men of Sukkoth and said, Here are Zeba and Zalmunna, about whom you ridiculed me, saying, Are you the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give bread to, weary, to your weary men? And he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Sukkoth. Now he didn't take a stick and wave it all about. He dragged them through those briars and the wilderness and, again, made them learn by experience that <clears throat> you should have listened to me when I came through and asked for help. So how does that relate to, again, cleaning house when we get saved? Well, again, the pockets of resistance, they can't be made a treaty with. They have to be eradicated. They have to be concentrated on. Certainly not everything all at once, because as a new believer, you feel invincible. I mean, you really do feel invincible. I'm just going to live for God. There is going to be no resistance. This is going to be wonderful. His word promises it to me. Oh, man, I can't wait. What are we actually going to do for the next 60 years of my life? It's going to be kind of boring because I'm perfect now. So, again, these areas and these pockets of resistance, not making treaty, not allowing, not just keeping it pruned, cleaning house. First John 1 John 1.7, <clears throat> but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we walk in the light, that light sheds light on us. When we see darkness in us, are we to fix it? And we work at fixing it so that we are cleansed. Now, please don't mistake that phrase, not works. It's not works that cleanses us, but that understanding of that can't stay. I mean, you can, you can be in a cave, really not knowing what's going on, but once you see the light and what lives in that cave, then you've got to address what lives in the cave. Depends if it's bigger than you or going to eat you, different things like that. But again, when you walk in that light and that light exposes what was in the dark and is now in the light, what are we going to do with that? <clears throat> well, reminds me of a story of a friend of ours had a... Uh, Another friend that went to his church, didn't really know him all that well, but uh, the guy came to church and wanted to tell everyone how blessed he was at the casino last night. And uh, the guy's like, whoa, hang on a minute. And uh, took him aside and shed some light on that for him. But again, that thinking of that man, you know, what did he do? He goes and feels like himself as a, a uh, probably a young believer, immature believer or just not knowledgeable in that area so again kind of that confronting him what's he going to do well he's got to make choices doesn't he he's either going to choose to yield to it choose to excuse it choose to work a way around it choose to let it live and hope it doesn't flare up I mean that's just the choices that we make learning and growing is the adventure adventure of our faith learning and growing where life is found you know, living and breathing, eating and sleeping, working, all very necessary. But where is life found in this life? A reborn and life is found in Christ. 
So obviously in serving him and learning and growing and again, using that learning and growing to worshiping, to worshiping him in learning and growing and using that as a way again, as an evidence and repeating and repeating it over and over again because it's too easy to be distracted or to get discouraged with where you're at when you look at other people. When you see how, what they have going on, maybe they're more blessed than you are, you feel like, or you know, things are easy for them and not for me and all the rest of it. Comparing one to another, we're warned against it. Focusing on, again, my area of ministry, learning and growing, being the adventure of where life is found because, again, in its truest essence, our life is already given over. So what's our life to be? Learning and growing and serving our king and getting better at that. You know, dodging some bullets here and there and enjoying the fact that you dodged it instead of having to put up with it. Um, learning obedience and submission are some others, but again, kind of back to being fully immersed. And again, not immersed in a philosophy or steps. I've done this, now you must do this. Immersed in Christ, learning and growing again, the lessons that come our way. I mean, I don't know about you, certainly can't remember all of them, but there's some that stick out and you build on that. Um, not good at everything, but the things that you're good at get better at. Things that you're not good at, train at and get better at. And, and enjoy that, enjoy learning and growing. Uh, in light of what God has given to us and what he calls us to, and again, it's, it's going to take a lifetime, but that's what we have given to him and that's what he wants from us again, learning and growing and using our life accordingly. Um, and back to the easy to get discouraged, less than enthusiastic or worse still hardened to aspects of a godly life. But that's not the way to leave it. Uh, so a bit of background on the passage, so verse four, verse four. I wrote four because it's page four at the top of the sheet. <coughs> Welcome to my world. Um, so a bit of background to the passage here. So uh, Colossians, another letter of Paul's from jail. Interesting to think, you know, in the eyes of someone at Colossae there, he's a political prisoner. And at the time writing a letter, you know, of love and instruction, it's to a church he hasn't visited. And it's not that they don't know anything about him. But at the time for just the general person on the street that might find themselves at church there. It's interesting to kind of put yourself in that perspective. You know, we take for granted because it's our Bible and it's Paul. We really don't question kind of how that letter came to these people, how it would have been received. Obviously, not everyone's on board. Some folks are and some folks aren't. Gnostics are looking to come in <clears throat> and uh, stir things up. There's heresy looking to creep in. I mean, just an average day at church, right? So again kind of looking at it from that perspective it's it's taken for granted i think and me personally too looking at it that everyone was on board and loving and enjoying and learning and being blessed by this letter because how paul writes it is he's asking questions of the reader of the listener he's asking them questions as he goes through i believe this do you believe that i believe this do you believe that because if you believe it and I believe it, we're brothers and we're sisters, and we're on the same page here. Because obviously as he's going through, maybe not everyone agreed with all things. Oh, shock, imagine that. So again, um, significant to realize and put ourselves in their shoes as we open up the passage. But he opens up the letter <clears throat> by forging a bond and like-mindedness by coming alongside their faith in Christ with his faith also. He is again not kind of going from the beginning he's getting straight into it there when we start off in verse 3 and then it doesn't stop like obviously until the end of the letter but as he opens up he's forging a bond and a like-mindedness by coming alongside their faith in Christ with his faith also trying to be on the same page with them form a bond again from a from a jail far away um, I believe this about God you know Paul saying how about you do you believe that as well Paul is engaging with the reader again, asking questions along the way, not in outright fashion, but uh, with his statements, moving from one point to the next to the next, 
Again, are you tracking with me? Are you staying with me? Are you, are you on board with me as we go through this? Making them think and analyze and question what they believe and why. And again, not through outright questions, but this is, the, the letter is so rich in how it portrays Christ that you're either on board and loving it, or again, you're not. I mean, Christ does that. Why is it that it's so one way or the other in life that we see out again in the marketplace? It's either for Christ or against him. It's spiritual. But uh, again, <clears throat> you know, not in outright fashion asking them questions, but making them think and analyze. And, you know, part of our faith being the growing side, the learning and the growing, the taking the hits, the making the mistakes, the learning and growing from that, not dwelling on it kind of thing unless it needs to be dwelt on you feel but but taking the lesson hopefully storing it away and calling it to mind next time around um, <clears throat> you know, so you know Paul not out not asking outright questions he's not kind of you know if you believe this turn to page 75 and, and the letter will continue on there and make you feel all the better um, you know God again doesn't quiz and then take feedback lays it out, do you agree? Um, you know, thinking of someone who's searching, someone who's genuinely searching for the truth in life really has no problem with reading the Bible. Because if you're genuinely seeking, then there's the answer right there. When you have someone that's genuinely seeking and comes away with every interpretation but that Christ is the Savior, you obviously know that the person's not genuinely seeking. They're using it as a cover. So, again, you know, thinking of God and not applying for the job, he's simply telling it how it is, and it's up to us to be on board or not. Um, but he, again, in, in the background here, so Paul goes on to speak of the preeminence of Christ. So, again, surpassing all others, he is it, the only one, then to be reconciled to Christ through his blood, and then on to the believer's correct response to such truth, and that it's a life of sacrificial service. So where we are this, this evening in verse 2 there, so from the paragraph kind of runs from chapter 2, verse 1 through uh, chapter, uh, sorry, chapter 2, verse 1 through verse 10, speaking of not philosophy but Christ. We'll end up in uh, verse 8 there for a little bit as well. That's a standout verse. And uh, <clears throat> again, knowing what we have, believing that it is the best, and then using it as it's intended having taken the time to learn, apply that learning and lessons to our benefit and those around. Paul before Agrippa. So Acts 26, verse 24 through 29. So again, finding life in the pursuit of Christ, in wanting to learn, in listening and being led, learning from the mistakes and moving forward. Acts 26, 24 read it to you now as he thus made his defense so speaking of paul festus said with a loud voice paul you are beside yourself much learning is driving you mad but he said i'm not mad most noble festus but speak the words of truth and reason for the king before whom i also speak freely knows these things for i'm convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. So they're an, a, an example of the power of knowing what we have in Christ. Being used to share the truth, and live your life before others. Um, Agrippa's dead, so we're not going to find ourselves in front of Agrippa like Paul did. But again, for the folks that we do find ourselves in front of, worth every moment of reading, worth every moment of prayer, worth every moment of correction and suffering and uh, again, seeking uh, to stand there and to be used and to have such confidence to have such confidence inside 
that what you believe and what you say, sorry, that what you say is what you believe and that what you believe is the truth. Um, <clears throat> another way to uh, think of what you have and, and using it. So uh, another example was uh, thinking of a carpenter you know, with a nail gun. And this will make sense when I kind of go along a little bit. Stick with me here if you would. So um, a carpenter with a nail gun and the time that it saves, the effort that is reduced by that tool. Such a useful tool in the hands of someone trained and skilled. They likely having scars and stories about the learning process, yet happy that he now knows not just that the tool exists or that it's useful, but how to and then take it further and learn all the other ways to use that tool in helping to get the job done. And here's kind of the fun part of that illustration, thinking of a young 10-year-old boy with a nail gun. So there's no way that little boy is letting that nail gun out of his sight. You will, warn, you will walk in at night, and there will be that nail gun on the pillow next to him. And uh, again, trying to take it, you know, thinking of the mentality of that little boy. I know I shouldn't bite you, Dad, but I'm going to if you try to take that gun. <clears throat> he can build with it. He can break stuff with it. He can hunt with it. And uh, no one would mess with him, you know, at the bus stop. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> nice gun. <clears throat> so uh, now that half of us are outside in our minds doing things with a nail gun that we never got to do, you know, the boy doesn't know what he has. He doesn't really know how to use it and do well with it. Kind of knows a little bit of what it does. But again, kind of looking back as you move through, you know, your Christian walk, a life of faith, in the early days we have an idea. And we enjoy because it's just nice. You're with the Lord. You're secure. I am yours and you are mine. And all of the passages that you read are just wonderful. And then comes the fight, then comes the learning, then comes the hits, then comes the, oh man, over and over. And you pick yourself up, right? It's enjoyable. I keep telling myself it's enjoyable. One foot in front of the other, one foot in front of the other. I've got a lot of respect for runners because I am, as you can see, I'm not a runner. And um, I tried and just doesn't work for me. You put a ball in front of me and I can run for quite a bit, but... Uh, just that stick to itness of doing something repetitively over and over and over again. And for us, you know, how our flesh wars against that, wars against it. Just getting up and making the bed. <clears throat> nice achievement to have under your belt before you start the day. Um, again, back to not a philosophy, but a person, not a set of rules or ritual, but a personal relationship with the living God. So amazing to think but it is a living relationship too. Um, I mean, looking, looking to be saved, kind of assuming that it's with God, but you know, not really knowledgeable of there being an actual relationship of the back and forth, the I'm interested in you, I want to I wanna know you, and, and well, you know what I mean. He already knows us, but that, that relationship of back and forth and that love and closeness and communion and bond. Uh, again, Almighty Creator is personally involved um, with each of us. So not looking for false humility or, you know, Eeyore mentality, I'm nothing but a speck. But I've lived with myself long enough. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the, su the surprises of God being that I love you. I want all of you. I want you know, to have all of you. And who wouldn't want to give that knowing who he is? So, again, not losing that, that, that joy and that, uh, that awe that, that comes with that personal relationship. Not off living and coming back. Not off living and coming back. It's unfortunate, but I, I think, well, I know I'm guilty of it, and I assume you might be well too. But uh, um, that doesn't really happen much in the world. You know, high ups don't hang out with the low downs all that much. I know some of you are thinking you're in the middle. You're not a lowdown. Um, please forgive me for calling you a lowdown. So, um, but you know, thinking back to school, I changed 
schools uh, six times. And this afternoon, thinking about that, making sure I was saying the right thing, I could only think of five. But then I remembered the sixth. So I'm working into the gray hairs nicely, it seems. But again, you know, back, at the, back in the school days, I mean, just like any impressionable kid, you want to hang out with the cool kids. Oh, look how cool they are. Um, so the last school, I ended up in the cool group. So grade 11, so what's that, 16 years old? End up in the cool group and really unaware. So Friday lunchtime, there sitting in amongst, you know, chatting. I was just had a qu very quiet moment by myself and I thought, I have arrived. I am in the cool group. So went back there naturally on the Monday morning and listened and just sat as a fly on the wall because I'm like, if they find out who I am, I am booted straight away. But again, listening to what they did and what they got up to, I was like, sorry, there is no way, no way my mum's going to let me do any of that. So I just quietly packed up my lunch and moved on and found my people. <laughs> and uh, I mean, just never went back, never even thought of, oh, well, maybe, or, you know, trying to, or it just doesn't happen. So again, kind of thinking of that caste system, you know, that's another philosophy of the world in, in some, again, some philosophies. You're down here, we're up here, you don't approach us, and you work your way up or you live your life for me and all the rest of it. So again, just the creator of the universe having that personal relationship. And um, obviously, just how beautiful that is in the beginning, but how much of a comfort that is as you move through life. Um, just a beautiful thing. So not only is there our relationship with God of the universe, but he goes further and uh, levels the playing field for us in service. So again, no caste system. <clears throat> Equal opportunity for all to serve and grow. That's pretty significant. You get pigeonholed all the way through life. You're never going to be this. Or, yeah, you can be everything, but you're not going to be everything. You're going to be this or that kind of thing. When it comes to God and, again, comes to his house and what he calls us to, how he gifts us, and then, again, how he equips us and then develops that throughout the years, gives us a ministry to tend to that is also living and valuable. So, again, just not losing that awe of, of again, seeing Christ as the head, seeing him as everything and living our life uh, for him and to that end in the sense of worshipping him in that sense. Um, you know, thinking of the, the area of ministry, uh, earlier days played some soccer. I was at uh, fullback because I wasn't a playmaker and I knew it. Let me defend here. No one gets past me. This is my area and I'll die before they get through me. Well, I wasn't that good, so it was a nice sentiment to start out with, but uh, just I was okay. Um, we did oranges at halftime. I don't know if you do that here, so now you know. Um, but again, you know, attacking, that wasn't my job. I knew it. Full back to defense, so not getting past. Um, so given that ministry, that area, and uh, tending to it, uh, kind of like a garden, you know, that hits home for me with my work, but uh, the gardener shows you around his garden, and I mean, it's nice when you go to a garden that's tended. I mean, it's just really beautiful, just such a beautiful thing. Everything within a garden can be a mess of the plants and how they grow and what they look like, different heights, but that person knows exactly where everything is and what, what everything needs, and then it's all nicely laid out, <clears throat> or maybe the condition of the garden isn't so nice and it's kind of like well there's the garden but let's get inside real quick before you see how bad the garden area is but again <clears throat> you know tending to that and enjoying that um, thinking of that at the house you know when we get out there as a family it's nice I go up the back of the yard to check and to recheck the shed isn't going to fall off the foundation and uh, go up there for a long time making sure of that while they do the work so uh, anyone, you know, having young boys, seeing them off doing anything else but working, unless you're watching. And then they got that look on their face, oh, and back to work. So again, you know, <clears throat> catch with a garden is sometimes that work that you do isn't rewarded with the fruit that you are after. 
got some bugs in there, you got some wet weather, got some unusually dry weather. I do all the right things as the tender of that garden and I get less than anticipated. And that's life. Welcome to a fallen world. Uh, and thinking of that, you know, Adam doesn't get blamed for very much. Um, God usually gets a lot of blame, but it shouldn't be so. You know, the weather that we have, the bugs that we have, we're the ones that gave up dominion, not God. Looking back, you know, as a kid, thinking that, well, if I had my time in the garden, there's no way I'd eat that fruit. That is dumb, dumb, dumb. And then now living life a little while, <laughs> it's just like, yeah, I would. I'd be eating that straight away. But, um, you know, thinking about Adam doesn't get blamed for very much. I mean, it was just, we had it and we gave it up. Don't like to admit it because that's us in the wrong. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to explore alternatives, but that's kind of how it is. Um, you know, we make our decisions. We don't, don't get to choose our consequences. Now, the world is very, very hard at work trying to convince us otherwise. And you see that just in daily life. You see that in some of the laws that are passed. You see that in how people live. Um, I really don't want the consequences. I want to make my choices. I want to choose what I choose. And I don't want the consequences. I don't want them at the start. I don't want them at the end. And I don't want all of the wh whatever's in the middle either. Um, rewording sin, repackaging sin, rebranding sin. You know, easy to be led astray and to think, well, I mean, it didn't hurt me the first time, so it's not going to hurt me the second time. Again, back to God's word as the filter. <clears throat> so yeah, just because it's not, again, laid out as the world advertising it as wrong, oh, no, you shouldn't, you, you really should restrain yourself. This is bad for you. Nope, they're very much hard at work wanting you to come in and devote yourself to that and be a casualty of what they believe. Um, <clears throat> you know, when thinking about getting influenced by a friend, Start making decisions based on that influence, and then you're down a path that will take time to recover from. Driving with a guy one time, he just overtook on a blind corner, complete disregard for life. Young guy, too, just finished up school. And um, I just, I had never been around that kind of, that type of person, and uh, very, very quickly got out of that vehicle and never wanted to be associated with, with that kind of thing again. Um, but easy to. You know, if that scene is cool and that's where you want to be, then, you know, life can come at you fast if, if that's what you're off doing. Well, let me read to you Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 9 through 18. <clears throat> uh, Colossians 1, 9 through 18. So maybe just over the page or the other side. And again, just looking at the preeminence of Christ. We're going to come to the end of this verse here, the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. And this will play into that explanation in there a little bit too. But uh, let me read to you, and in, in, in thinking of, again, not a philosophy, but Christ. So not ascribing to a philosophy, yet obviously in philosophy is the search of wisdom, the love of wisdom, and we having the, the truth obviously having that wisdom but colossians 1 9 through 18 for this reason we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the lord fully pleasing him being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of god strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and, on, and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Again, our faith is in Christ. 
the preeminence of Christ, not philosophy about Christ. But again, in him, in him, by him, all things for him, very prominent in that passage. And again, Paul using that to lay out to the believer, this is the foundation. This is where you work from. This is what you're ascribing to. This is what you're enjoying. This is what you have. <clears throat> again, do you believe it? Um, that they're, So back to chapter 2, verse 2, first few verses there. Oh, that was the introduction, by the way, too. So Just so you know. Uh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love. So love for Christ and the brethren, plugging in, serving, sticking around, taking some hits and learning from them, and enjoying the benefit of being knit together. Um, you know, seeing God take such diverse people and knit them together. You look out in the 242 on a Sunday, quite a lot of different people out there, all loving the Lord and enjoying being knit together. Um, and, and something that the Lord does quite nicely. You're going to need these people that are alongside you. You might not need all of them, but you're going to need them. You might not be friends with everyone. You know, some folks are just different to others. But by and large, the fellowship of the body is going to be a protecting factor for you. So plug in, serve, hang out, learn and grow and enjoy fellowship together and again you'll see that there are blessings to be had in that um, <clears throat> first corinthians 12 4 there are diversities of gifts but the same spirit there are differences of ministries but the same lord and there are diversities of activities but it is the same god who works all in all but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. It's unfortunate when you have a gift and it's not exercised. You know, God already gifts you. You're saved, you've got, you've, you've got gifts. And to see it on pause, the body lacks because of that. Um, obviously, the Lord's going to take care of take care of those things but working and uh, serving you, you see the ministry close up you know the uh, the wedding at Cana where the, the water pots were filled they ran out of wine the water pots were filled the servants were the ones who got to see that water turn to wine other folks around the tables just happily off enjoying you know the, the festivities and not to say you've always got to be serving or anything like that. I'm not, that's not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is those who saw the Lord at work close up were the ones actually doing the work and, this, and the serving alongside one another. But that part there for the profit of all. You know, service is for the profit of ourselves. We, we learn to, uh, well, we learn to, uh, hmm. Well, most of you have served. You know the rest of it. <coughs> I'm teasing. How you're developed when you serve. You come in serving and, and enjoying where the Lord has led you. And then you find out sometimes people don't agree with you on everything all the time. And you've got to decide what you do with that. Are they at fault? Am I at fault? I mean, it's a learning process. So it's, again, another area of our faith that we take and we enjoy and we open up new ground. But as that ground is open up, it's not all roses, right? So serving and enjoying being part of the work, again, you get to see that work close up. But uh, it is such a blessing to see because you get an idea of how ministry takes place. You get an idea of what it takes to have this work and have this move forward. And you're just more involved. There's more of you consumed for the Lord. And it, again, it is a beautiful thing. Uh, attaining to all riches. So that next part of the verse. And attaining to all riches. So, uh, you know, the word attaining obviously has an ongoing part to that word. It's an ongoing endeavor. Uh, so Colossians 2.8. <clears throat> just a few verses down. Beware lest anyone cheat you 
through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world. And that last part there, and not according to Christ. So again, running it through the filter of the word of God, not being cheated. <clears throat> Attaining to all riches. So again, focused on moving forward and not sitting around being led astray. Not having time to kind of sit back Kind of like David, not going out to battle. <clears throat> and uh, not to say you don't take seasons of rest, and I'm not trying to be all inclusive of that explanation. But again, lest anyone cheat you, you're the one being cheated. They may well have been cheated themselves, and now they're looking to impart that cheating onto you. It's weird that people get hurt, and I, I'm, I'm upset that I'm hurt, but the way for me to be happy with myself is to... To, to get you hurt um, just odd how that works but again the difference between the world and how the Lord works uh, empty deceit according to the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ so knowing what you have knowing how to use it and having that again having the finality that this is mine and I don't want anything else. I don't need anything else. Again, because we look like we uh, looked at that verse in Second Peter, I have all things in Christ. Uh, First Peter 4, 1 through 4, 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Um, on that verse 4-4, four, four, their King James Bible wherein they think it strange that ye not run with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. And I thought that was rather poetic with current events there, the word uh, riot there instead of dissipation. So for those who, uh, again, the, the long word dissipation there, had to kind of knew the general meaning but looked it up and just found a wealth of, of, uh, uh, a wealth of wisdom there for that word. So Webster's Dictionary for dissipation. So how do these two tie together? So verse 4 there, in regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them. So Colossians 2 verse 8, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy, empty deceit, and according to the basic principles of the world. You are the target. Your faith is the target. <clears throat> so maybe you won't believe a total lie. Maybe you can just believe some of it. Again, they're looking to steal from you. Um, but the same flood of dissipation, you know, they're caught up in sin. They obviously don't see it as sin. They're caught up in their lifestyle. They do what they do. And they're surprised that, well, it's not too bad. I mean, look at me. I'm not that bad of a person. Yeah, but a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Um, but back to this word dissipation. So in physics, in a physics application, the insensible loss or waste of the minute parts of a body which fly off, by which means the body is diminished or consumed. And that was English too, that wasn't Chinese. So, you know, the, the insensible loss, the waste, um, by which means the body is diminished. Uh, another explanation, scattered attention or that which diverts and calls off the mind of any subject. So again, living for Christ, their flood of dissipation takes them places and consumes their mind and consumes their lifestyle with what they're chasing after, quite opposite to ours. Um, <clears throat> for sake of time, I'll leave it there. But, uh, you know, just thinking uh, uh, of the dictionary and just it being a book that you open and you read, it's, uh, it's kind of nice to look things up, but also nice to to know that a dictionary still exists. Um, you know, searching to, again to their own destruction. 
and that of others outside of God's truth. Unfortunate, unnecessary, and goes on all the time. Uh, of the full assurance of understanding there, so another part to that verse 2. Of the full assurance of understanding. So many people in life claim that they're seeking knowledge. Even, um, you know, what is truth? The explan the uh, the uh, the expression. You know, what is truth? Uh, in a marketplace of lies, sometimes truth is lost. Uh, you seeking after it, you will find it. As we said before, if you're seeking after, you're genuinely seeking after God. You're seeking after salvation. You're seeking after the truth of life. What is all of this about? Why am I here? What am I doing? All the rest of it. If you're genuinely seeking, they will find. Because <clears throat> the Lord wants to reach out. But uh, Paul wants them to know what God has for them. So the full assurance of understanding. And what they have as children of God. And to trust in that truth so much. They willingly and lovingly give their lives over and over. And then on to growing in faith as to confirm their heart on the outside. That others may see God at work in their life and another kingdom revealed against the backdrop of guessing and constant philosophizing and deceiving and being deceived. And for those English majors in here, philosophizing is not a word. I just made it up. But it fits. Again, guessing and philosophizing and deceiving and being deceived chasing after one another I have the truth I have the truth and living life accordingly but um, for us the full assurance of understanding you know easy to know that that God is truth and to know that his word is truth and to have it there and maybe to learn afterwards when you find the passage that applied to the position that you found yourself in and didn't do so well that there it is but uh, again, that, that enjoyment of the full assurance of understanding and not some, uh, remaining in love with the Lord, you know, not growing cold. Revelation 2.4, nevertheless, I have this against you that you've left your first love. And that, that excitement, that fervor. So the first love is the first kind of part of your love. So giving your life to the Lord. And again, that excitement, that uh, initial joy, and then along comes life. You know, we must remember that labor isn't a substitute for love, and purity isn't a substitute for passion. We must have both to please him. Well, I've got a story. This one's from J. Vernon McGee. So if you don't like it, you can write him a letter. Um, the story is told in New England, and it's about two girls who worked in a cotton mill. They were friends, but when one of them quit working there, they lost touch with each other. Finally, they met one day on the street. The working girl asked her friend, are you still working? No, she said, I got married. When that girl worked in the mill, she watched the clock. And every evening when five o'clock came, she had her coat on and was on her way out. It was hard work, and she didn't like it. Now she is married, and she says that she has quit working. Well, <clears throat> if you could look at her life, you wouldn't think she had quit working. She gets up earlier than ever before to prepare breakfast for her husband and to pack his lunch. Then she throws her arms around him as she tells him goodbye. All day long, she is busy cleaning house and washing clothes and caring for two little brats who are two little angels to her because they are hers. Then when five o'clock comes, she doesn't put on her coat and leave. She starts cooking dinner. About six o'clock, here comes her husband. She is right there at the door to throw her arms around him and tell him how much she has missed him that day. When a man comes home in the evening, opens the door, and hears a voice from upstairs or from the rear of the house, is that you? He knows the honeymoon is over. But this girl is in love. Her husband's work day is over but hers has just gotten started she serves dinner to her husband and feeds the children then she washes the dishes puts the children to bed and that's not easy and works around getting things ready for her husband for the next day I tell you she is weary when she finally gets into bed but she's not working anymore she says why because she's in love 
and that's the difference. Now, ladies, I want you to know I haven't been sitting on this for weeks. I haven't been looking, oh, yes, I get to use it. I came across it in preparation, and there it is. Um, <clears throat> remaining in love there, but such a very, very beautiful picture. Remaining in love that there be a full assurance of understanding of our faith and using that love to keep in communion and, again, to understand more and more of our faith. Uh, well, the last part there, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. So you can look over the page at Colossians 1.27. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of, his, of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So speaking of the mystery among the Gentiles, the church, but deeper still, Paul wants them to see Christ as the head. He wants them to see Christ as the head of the body and all believers, members of the body. Um, again, Colossians 1.18, where we read there before, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Um, if if Paul, Paul's thinking, if I can get them focused on Christ, it's going to take care of the Gnostics, because what they have to offer, though it might be sweet at the start, only ends with rottenness. And again, for us, if we can keep fixed on him, <clears throat> it will keep us from straying. Um, for it pleased the Father again that in him all the fullness should dwell. From uh, verse 19 there as well. Um, so, you know, being called wisdom. Uh, just can't be called wisdom because it says so. And that's really what a lot of the world is chanting. This is wisdom, that is wisdom. Jesus said wisdom will be justified by her children. Um, I'm not going to get into it for sake of time. But within that statement, you know, look at the life. Look at the life of the person that's involved in that. Look at where it takes them. Look at the consequences thereof. And obviously for us being good, I mean, surely not getting it all right. And uh, again, surely not getting it all right. But aiming towards it and being used and enjoying that process of learning and taking those lumps and moving forward certainly not perfect but moving in that direction of more and more like Christ and uh, for other people to see is quite powerful because again wisdom being justified by all the children takes time in the sense of if you're looking at it for your life well I make these choices and if I don't you know end up getting hurt immediately then it must be wisdom because everyone else has said it's wisdom or this person said it's wisdom or whatever the case may be no, it's, it's pointing to look at the life that, that that thinking and that philosophy produces. What is the fruit? You'll know them by their fruits. So what's the fruit of those decisions and where does that life take you? And again, for us, <clears throat> learning to be led, you know, quite difficult. The Holy Spirit, obviously. Um, for us, being the guide, the one we, we talk to in the sense of, what do I do? Moving us and uh, learning as a believer to sometimes just allow the Holy Spirit to answer for you. You know, when you get it right, and it's like amazingly right, you know it was him. Because, <clears throat> again, I've, I've talked enough to know that, you know, if it's not fantastic, it's probably me. But, uh, well, for sake of time, I think we'll, we'll finish up. Um, quickly, though, for, for those who'd like to, Colossians 3 and 4, a nice response to that life, again, that we're talking about here. But I do want to finish up in Genesis real quick because remaining dependent and learning dependency, learning that it's not Christ, but it is not philosophy, sorry, but it's Christ. It's in him our trust is and our faith is, and it's him that, again, we're looking more and more like. Genesis 48, 17 through 19 and um, speaking of, uh, <clears throat> again, the, uh, just that settled faith. I'll read it to you. Now, when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. 
But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He, shall, he also shall become a people and also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he. And his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. All that had happened in Jacob's life. <clears throat> I mean, just all that had happened, the things that he had seen. And this takes place with uh, his son, Joseph. And his Joseph said, no, 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 no. You've got to put your, your hand on the firstborn and, and bless him with the larger portion. And Jacob just simply says, I know. But this is the way the Lord has it done. And I can't change it. And you're not going to change it because that's what he wants to do. And just a very, very nice picture of a man arriving at the place where God is in control. And look at my life and all of the blessings that I have seen, all that I have come into, because I have, again, lived my life after him. And again, we look at his life, certainly not every moment of every day, but a life submitted. Well, let's pray. We do give you thanks, Lord, for all of your love, your truth, and your grace, and your mercy in us. And uh, may you find us putting it to use. We love you and worship you. Ask that you get us home safely. In Jesus' name, amen.